Turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. We will be reading verses 3 through 14 of this epistle, which is typically classified correctly as one of Paul's prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon are all letters that Paul wrote while he was under house arrest. And it seems appropriate <clears throat> that, given our present circumstances, that we should turn our attention to this prison epistle. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, <clears throat> even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory." Lord God, as we consider the many blessings that you provide for us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray that you would enable us to see clearly how blessed we are, though we are under our own house arrest. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 14 is a notoriously theologically heavy passage of Scripture. It is also grammatically a nightmare because it's as if Paul, he just can't get it out fast enough. And, and actually verses 3 through 14 are one long run-on sentence in the original language. And so it has its own difficulties uh, grammatically, theologically. And, and one thing that I think would be beneficial is, is to work through this text just uh, briefly. And in order to get the whole scene in our minds, kind of add to our already pre-existing diagram. Some of the concepts you'll see that we've talked about as we've gone through the book of Romans they're going to make an appearance. And, and so as we begin to walk through this, Paul says, verse 4, that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So where would we put it up here? Well, since it's before the foundation of the world, he chose us way back then, in eternity past. And by the way, the, the selection Another word for God choosing is election. And, and we'll break that down more in a moment. But he chose us before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless. And so both of those are going to go over here. Because that's what's happening right now. That's where we are in him. And so in love, and this is what's interesting about the love of God, it's connected to his predestining us. In love, he predestined us. So we already have it over here. 
And we could write love over here, but as you know, while God loves us from eternity, his love certainly manifests itself now. And so, where do you put it? Well, it's, it's all over. We could write love in great big letters all across all of time, space, and eternity. But he predestined us for adoption as sons. And again, that takes place before time even begins. According to the purpose, and we know from Ephesians chapter 3, this is God's eternal purpose. According to the purpose of his will. So we can put the will of God up here as well because his will exists even from eternity past. To the praise of his glorious grace. Now this phrase is going to show up again in verse 12, the end of verse 12, to the praise of his glory, and also at the end of verse 14, to the praise of his glory. And where in the world would we put that in the grand scheme of things? I'm actually going to say that this is, this is an umbrella statement that again, kind of like love, encompasses all of time and space. I'm actually going to put it up here. To the praise of his glory, everything that's going on in all of human history from eternity to eternity is all about the glory of God and that his glory is to be praised. Uh, back to verse 6, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. We're going to put the blessing. We are blessed now in time and space, and it's connected to blameless, it's connected to being, uh, it's according to the purpose and the will of God, it's according to his choice of us. Yeah, we're, we're blessed in the beloved, and that would be Jesus. And in fact, that phrase, in him, shows up again and again, and we're talking about Jesus. It's in Christ that we have all of these things. In him, verse 7 begins, right? In him. It's all pointing back to the cross and what Jesus did. We have redemption through his blood. The blood Jesus shed on the cross provides us with redemption and forgiveness, right? He says both of those things here in verse 7. Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, to the praise of his glorious grace, right? I think that's pointing back to that as well, which he lavished upon us. He's lavishing us right now in time and space in all wisdom and insight. The wisdom and the insight of God he's talking about here. And so we could, we could add that over here. Uh, making known to us the mystery of his will. Now you get to chapter 3 and you find out the mystery of God is what God was doing in Christ for Jews and Gentiles. The unification of the Jewish people and the Gentile people, all people into one body, and that one body being reconciled to God through Christ. And so mystery, that belongs here because it's what God was doing, but it's the mystery of his will. It goes all the way back to eternity past. When was he making it known? And I submit to you the making known process starts when God creates everything and is completed here because now the mystery has been made known. It's been made fully known in Christ. But he was making it known. All, all this stuff, all that you read in Genesis and Exodus and 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, all of this, even through the exile, all of it, God was making known the mystery of his will. Now it was a mystery here for sure. But now it's been made known fully in Christ. According to his purpose, got that up here, which he set forth in Christ. There it is. He set forth that mystery. He was making it known before and now in Christ it has been made known. As a plan, that goes over here. This is another word for God's will, for his purpose, his plan which all originated in eternity. For the fullness of time, that's, that's here. This is, this is the pinnacle of human history. 
This is the moment to which everything before was driving and from which everything flows. This moment in history to unite all things, things in heaven, things on earth. That's, that unification process is happening even now. That's what, that's what the gospel is for. That's what Christ came to do is to unite all things in heaven and on earth. In him, in Christ, we have obtained, that happens now, we have it, we have obtained an inheritance. Now this is where it gets interesting, right? And this is, we talked about this a bit in Romans chapter 8, about how Paul can write about glorification as though it's an accomplished thing, because in the mind of God, it's a done deal. An inheritance. Paul is pointing us to what we're going to get when all of time is over. After Jesus comes back, after the judgment, all of that, we get our inheritance. Because of Christ. In Him we have obtained this inheritance. And uh, having been predestined, notice this, notice it goes from eternity to eternity. He predestined in Him. We have this inheritance. We've obtained it according to of Him who works all things. All right. Uh, so works all things. Works all things. That's what God has been doing throughout all of time and space. God is working all things according to the counsel of His will. Right? And so, and so God, He's been working all throughout here to bring Jesus into the world. And then since then, He's still working all things that we might be holy, blameless, have redemption, forgiveness, uniting all things. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. Again, it's all going to glory as well. In Him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, that belongs over here, you heard the call of the gospel the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him. That belongs over here. When you believed, you were justified. You became a blessed person. You were redeemed. You were sealed. Sealed. That, that sealing goes over here. Ran out of space, right? Sealed. How? Sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of... The inheritance, until we acquire possession of it, that it can also be translated as until God redeems it, to the praise of His glory. All of this is to, is that God would be glorified and God would be praised. Come now as we stand and sing, right? I mean, that's, woo! That's everything that Paul has been talking about here. He has been saying... That, and he includes himself, we, he includes himself, we have all of these blessings, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit conspiring to bless us. And remember, as I said, this is Paul writing while he's under house arrest. He acknowledges, I am blessed even while under house arrest. And I say to you, my brothers and sisters, although we are under stay-at-home orders. We have our own house arrest orders. Though we are under house arrest, we are still blessed as well. Because these blessings which belong to Paul and the first century church belong to us as well as the New Testament church. As we are Christ's church, we too have all of these blessings. When we do what they did, we in turn get what they got. And so what are these blessings? And, and there's no way we can cover all of them with the time that we have remaining. But I do want to look at just a few of these. A few of these blessings that the triune God blesses Christians with. And again, there's so many. I mean, just start in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with a few. Spiritual blessing. Is that what yours says? 
with some of the spiritual blessings? No, no, no. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Wow. You can actually break down chapter 1, start in verse 3 and go to verse 6, and, and these are how these are blessings that God the Father blesses us with. And then verses 7 through 11, attention is turned to the Son and the blessings that the Son gives us. And then verses 13 and 14, here is God the Holy Spirit and the blessings that God the Holy Spirit blesses us with. So let's start with the blessings of the Father. And again, there are several. We could talk about election. We can talk about predestination. We can talk about grace. We can talk about holiness and all these different things. But I guess if I were to pick one, let's zoom in real close for a moment on the choice. Election. God the Father blesses us with election. And this is a very theologically loaded word, very dense theological term. And it simply means that God selected. God made a choice. God picked out certain individuals. And that is to say he selected Christians. He chose, Christians are the chosen ones. We are chosen out of the world. And it's interesting that this election, it takes place along with the calling. Because he talks about how you heard the word of truth in verse 12, the gospel of your salvation. And, and again, this is where, and, and Paul talks about this elsewhere, by the way, how God chose us and it's according to the calling of the gospel. You can read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, where he talks about that as well, and, and kind of a parallel structure there. But how do we explain this, this choice, this election, this, this choosing that God does? And while it, it does take place here, there's also a component that happens here, right? Because we do choose God. We as free will, morally responsible individuals, we make a choice of our own. And yet Paul can talk about the choice God makes from eternity. How? Well, again, from the divine perspective, the moment of selection takes place for God in eternity, while for us, the moment of selection takes place in time, the moment that we hear the gospel, believe the gospel, and obey the gospel, and choose to live our lives for God. We can say it this way. The moment that I chose, he chose me. And yet those moments, on the one hand, are at a temporal perspective for us, but for God it's from an eternal perspective. And all of this, again, because God is a God who sees the entire scope as an eternal now because he himself stands outside of time. And so that's how we can say that the moment I chose him is the moment he chose me. And yet, it's a moment from eternity which takes place in time. And just <laughs> the time-space stuff here and even the beyond time and space stuff, it can boggle the mind. And so, and yet... This is one of the blessings that God gives us. It is connected to predestination. We could talk about that. It's connected to His grace, to the praise of His glorious grace. Because that's the thing is, we didn't earn this. And we, we don't deserve the favor of God. And yet, He has shown us His favor in His choosing us. Even before the foundation of the world, as Paul says. And yet, God did it. And he does it by his grace. And so the Father, he blesses us with election. And now let's turn our attention briefly to the Son. God the Son. What are the blessings that the Son gives us? And we can talk about redemption. We can talk about wisdom. How he lavished upon us his grace in wisdom and insight. And we can talk about the inheritance. And it's hard to pick just one, right? Because it's... I mean, the redemption and the forgiveness that we have by blood. The blood, the precious blood that Jesus shed on the cross. 
obtains for us redemption, a marketplace term. He went into the marketplace of the world and he purchased us with his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses, all of our sins completely washed away. But I suppose if I were to talk about one, it would have to be the inheritance. How God the Son blesses us with an inheritance. Verse 11, in Him, that's in Christ. Yes, in Him, we have obtained an inheritance. Having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. And this is what's interesting about predestination in this context is the emphasis is on the thing that is predestined. Verse 5, we've been predestined for adoption as sons. That's, that happens now. And in verse 11, the predestination has to do with our inheritance, that God, before time began, He had a certain destiny in mind for all those who would obey the gospel and, and follow after the Son. And that predetermined destiny is the inheritance that is yet future for us in eternity future. When we are elected by God, He elects us, we choose Him. When we are adopted into the family of God, when our sins are forgiven, when we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus, then we have obtained an inheritance in Christ. And, and again, this is what's interesting about the way Paul writes this. We have obtained, you can even hear it in the English, is a past tense thing. And in fact, it points to that event in history. When we were redeemed, when we were forgiven the very first time, when did that happen? Well, it happened when we obeyed the gospel. It happened when we were baptized. The culminating event of uh, becoming a Christian. And so we have obtained this inheritance. God gives us this inheritance. Even God the Son gives us this inheritance. And this word inheritance, it actually has Old Testament roots. It goes back to Deuteronomy, where Israel was God's inheritance. It goes back to uh, Jeremiah 10 and verse 16. Also Jeremiah 51 verse 19, where the, the identical phrase is used, where Israel is the tribe of God's inheritance. Well, now, all that God was for Israel, it's true that that's the same case for the church now. God is all these things for the church. It's interesting the way that this phrase here kind of gets worked, both by commentators and by translators. On the one hand, translators usually tend to emphasize how we become partakers of an inheritance, whereas commentators talk about how we are made the inheritance. Well, which is it? Biblically speaking, both of those are accurate. We are made partakers of an inheritance. We have an inheritance that awaits us and that we even get a glimpse of in the here and now. And on the other hand, it's true that we become God's inheritance. We are made an inheritance for God. What does God get? When all of time and space and all this stuff is done, what is it that God gets? Well, you actually go to verse 18, and we are told that we are called, and we are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints. In other words, what does God get when it's all said and done? He gets us. We are His inheritance. Wow. And so on the one hand, we are made an inheritance, God's inheritance. And on the other hand, we have an inheritance waiting for us as well that we will partake of one day uh, when it's all over. So you have this double inheritance or this mutual inheritance where God gets us and then we get God as well. And all this made possible because of Jesus. In Him, we have obtained this inheritance. And finally, the Spirit... The Spirit blesses us as well. And we are blessed in that the Holy Spirit seals us and guarantees this inheritance. We are sealed, as we talked about, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And this was a term that 
would have been understood in their day as a, uh, well, it was used in mailing. Suppose you wanted to mail a letter back in the day, and you wanted to make sure that it wasn't tampered with while it was in transit. Well, what would happen is you would take that letter and you would package it. You'd take a piece of, uh, a bit of melted wax and put it on uh, on the, the letter itself. And, and, and you would take your ring, your signet ring, and you would press it into that soft wax. And it would bear that seal. And if the letter got to its destination and that seal had been tampered with, it were broken the recipient would know that there had been tampering with it. The seal was broken. You also had, contextually, a number of religious cults in Paul's day who would tattoo their initiates. Those, those people who wanted to be initiated into the religious cult would take a, a, some sort of tattoo, and that tattoo would be the seal. The Jews, of course, they had the seal of the covenant, which was circumcision. And perhaps... One or several of these are on Paul's mind as he talks about how the Holy Spirit, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The Spirit serves as a guarantee that we will be delivered without being tampered with, as it were. The, the Spirit serves that unseen Holy Spirit as an invisible tattoo on the heart, identifying us to the Father. And of course, he serves as a seal, marking us out as the covenant community of God. And so we bear this seal, this spiritual seal in our hearts. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. And the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire it. All people who have heard the gospel, who have heard the gospel and put their faith in Christ, believed in him, says verse 13. All of us have this promise. All of us have the Holy Spirit and he is a guarantee. The term there, guarantee, is a commercial term. It had to do with a down payment, a deposit that was made. And it always pointed to something bigger and something greater than itself. I mean, we, we have this in our own lives, don't we? You, you hear people make money-back guarantees. You will love it or we'll give you your money back. They are saying that this thing that you are purchasing with your money is going to give you such a return that you don't want the money. You want the greater thing. It's kind of like, a, what was his name? Zimmerman? Uh, George? Uh, Men's Warehouse, right? You're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it, right? Again, the thing that he's providing is you're going to look good, and if you look good, you're going to feel good. I think that's the idea, right? You're going to have a good time. And so, yeah, you're, you're going to give him your money so that you can look good. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance, that you will get this inheritance so long as you remain faithful to God and you uphold the covenant. So long as you determine to be a faithful Christian, you choose solidarity, loyalty with God, with Christ, the Holy Spirit. Listen, you're going to get here and you're going to like the way you look. God guarantees it. That's the guarantee of our inheritance. And the Holy Spirit, on the one hand, he's a foretaste of glory divine. And on the other hand, he's a promise of the future full reward and inheritance that is to be ours. And listen, God is faithful, and he will complete the transaction one day. We've got the down payment, the deposit, and, and the thing that we will receive, our heavenly inheritance, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be beyond everything. All of the suffering and even all the good stuff in this life, it's all going to fade away and pale in comparison to the greater thing, the inheritance that is to be ours. And so, all of this to the praise of His glory. Yeah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all conspiring to bless us immeasurably. Every blessing. Listen, that is all that God the Father can bestow upon us. Every blessing is all that the Son, God the Son, can provide us. 
And every blessing is all that the Spirit can apply to our lives. And so the resources of the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they all conspire to bless His church. Even while under house arrest, we are immeasurably blessed. Let's commit this to prayer, shall we? Father, I want to pray for my brothers and my sisters right now. And I pray that we would see the glorious blessings that you have for us. Father, the election. Son, the inheritance. Holy Spirit, the guarantee. And may we see how you are blessing us in a way that is just, it boggles our minds. And Father, if, if, there, if there is a person right now who is hearing this and, and they have not yet put their faith and trust in Jesus, I pray that you would give them a clear vision of everything that you are up to in all of history and how you have been conspiring even to their advantage if they will bow the knee to King Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would enable them, to, enable them to see your glorious plan throughout all of time and space and what it means for their lives and that they would give their life to Jesus and become a Christian. And then, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for your glorious grace and for the glory that is to be ours in him. We pray all this through Christ our Lord. Amen.